do whatever you offer or give away, and whatever austerities you perform, do that, O son of Kunti, as an offering to me. In the following verse, Krishna continues by saying, in this way, you will be freed from the bondage to work and the auspicious and inauspicious results. With your mind fixed on me and this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and come to me. In this verse, we are assured that if we perform devotional service and always think of Krishna, we will return to him. This verse also re reinforces the point Yukta Vairagya by saying, with your mind fixed on me in this principle of renunciation, if, and then Sritan writes, if we accrue our devotion and fix our mind upon Krishna, we will go back to him. And this is confirmed in this verse. The same point is, is stated in verse 1155. So from this, we can conclude that Yukta Vairagya is the path to reach Krishna. Okay, uh, true. Again, I have a little trouble, a little problem with the original statement that Yukta Vairagya means to renounce material things to better serve Krishna. Hmm. I would say it's better to define Yukta Vairagya as uh, to learn how to employ everything in the service of Krishna. In other words, every action you perform is to engage your mind, senses, and all material things in the service of Krishna. So let's see. Let's go back to verse 610. It says, A transcendentalist, 610, Yogi Yunjita Satatam, Atmanam Rahasistita, Ekaki Yatachita Atma, Nirasir Aparigraha. A transcendentalist should always engage his body, mind, and self in relationship with the Supreme. He should live alone in a secluded place and should always carefully control his mind. He should be free from desires and feelings of possessiveness. So in the purport, Prabhupada says, Krishna is realized in different degrees as Brahman, Paramatma, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna consciousness means concisely to be always engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. But those who are attached to the impersonal Brahman or localized Supersoul are also partially Krishna conscious because impersonal Brahman is the supreme ray or, or is the spiritual ray of Krishna and Supersoul is the all-pervading partial expansion of Krishna. Thus, the impersonalist and the meditator are also indirectly Krishna conscious. A directly Krishna conscious person is the topmost transcendentalist because such a devotee knows what is meant by Brahman and Paramatma. His knowledge of the absolute truth is perfect, whereas the impersonalist and the meditative yogi are imperfectly Krishna conscious. Nevertheless, all of these are instructed herewith to be constantly engaged in their particular pursuits so that they may come to the highest perfection sooner or later. The first business of a transcendentalist is to keep the mind always on Krishna. One should always think of Krishna and not forget him even for a moment. Concentration of mind on the Supreme is called samadhi or trance. In order to concentrate the mind, one should always remain in seclusion and avoid disturbance by external objects. He should be very careful to accept favorable and reject unfavorable conditions that affect his realization. And in perfect determination, he should not hanker after unnecessary material things that entangle him by feelings of possessiveness. All these perfections and precautions are perfectly executed when one is directly in Krishna consciousness because direct Krishna consciousness means self-abnegation, wherein there's very little chance for material possessiveness. So that's why I think Sritan, I'm just guessing, 
That's why Sri Tan says that Yukta Varga means to renounce material things to better serve Krishna. So, yes, uh, this is where you get the idea of self-abnegation, wherein there's very little chance for material possessiveness. So, I think, however, you misunderstood the meaning of self-abnegation. And I'll explain. So then it says, Srila Rupa Goswami characterizes Krishna consciousness in this way. Anasakta shevishayan yatarham upayun jitaha nirbanda krishna sambande yukta vairagim ruchite. Prapa chikataya buddhya hari sambande vanstuna mumukshu bihi pratya jo vairagim falgo katyate. When one is not attached to anything, but at the same time accepts everything in relation to Krishna, one is rightly situated above possessiveness. So that's my point, Sri Tan, that when one is not attached to anything, okay, that's what you're saying uh, when you say that. Uh, you do, let's see, yukta vairagya means to renounce material things to better serve Krishna. And Falgaraya by I guess false renunciation obstructs the path to Krishna consciousness. So when you say renounce everything, uh, it's possible that you could uh, get that idea from uh, when Prabhupada says, because direct Krishna consciousness means self-abnegation. But self-abnegation is not that you renounce everything material. Self-abnegation is you renounce using everything for your selfish purpose. However, you use everything in the service of Krishna. It's not that you renounce it uh, completely. You, 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 you renounce using it for your or my or your personal sense gratification, but you don't renounce using it for the pleasure of Krishna. Okay, so, and here it says, because direct Krishna consciousness means self-abnegation, wherein there is very little chance for material possessiveness. So that material possessiveness is what you renounce, not the use of things in the service of Krishna. So, and then in the definition, uh, of the verses from Rupa Goswami, it says, when one is not attached to anything, but at the same time accepts everything in relation to Krishna. So that's the part you forgot. Of course, later on you, you say the same, you say approximately the same thing, but you cannot say that Krishna consciousness uh, or, or yukta vairagya means um, renounce material things to better serve. Well, you could renounce using material things for your own selfish sense gratification in order to better serve Krishna by learning to use those same things in the service of Krishna. That's what you have to write. On the other hand, one who rejects everything without knowledge of its relation to Krishna is not as complete in his renunciation. So that's the position of the Mayavadis, and people in general who categorically renounce everything, but don't, uh, including using those things in the service of Krishna. That's the mistake that they make. But the devotee doesn't make that mistake. He, he renounces everything as far as using it for his own sense gratification, but then he, uses everything in correctly in the service of Krishna. On the other hand, one who rejects everything without knowledge of its relationship to Krishna is not as complete in his renunciation. A Krishna conscious person well knows that everything belongs to Krishna, and thus he is always free from feelings of personal possession. As such, he has no hankering for anything on his own personal account. He knows how to accept things in favor of Krishna consciousness 
and how to reject things unfavorable to Krishna consciousness. He's always aloof from material things because he is always transcendental. And he's always alone, having nothing to do with persons not in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, a person in Krishna consciousness is the perfect yogi. So here we see the fine, uh, let's say, nuance that Prabhupada gives, and the word nuance, N-U-A, uh, N-U-A, and CE. So that means that he has no hankering for anything on his own personal account. He knows how to accept things in favor of Krishna's con Krishna consciousness and how to reject things unfavorable to Krishna consciousness. Well, uh, Is it possible then to use everything in Krishna consciousness uh, properly? Well, it says that he knows how to accept things favorable of Krishna consciousness and how to reject things unfavorable to Krishna consciousness. So let's say, let's take the case of marijuana. The devotee would reject the use of marijuana for intoxication or for personal pleasure. But he might use the marijuana plant to make um, paper in which you can write about Krishna or cloth by which you can make clothing for Krishna or uh, biodiesel by which you could drive your car to go on Sankirtan. So, uh, he would reject the use of it for, for intoxication. But, he, but if it's possible to use the same thing in the service of Krishna, he would not reject that. Okay? So, he knows how to accept things in favor of Krishna consciousness and how to reject things unfavorable to Krishna consciousness. So the same thing is rejected. The marijuana plant would be rejected for sense gratification. But, it, it, but if it's possible to use it to make things that are useful to Krishna consciousness, such as paper or biodiesel or clothing, then he would not reject that. Okay. He is always aloof from material things because he's always transcendental and is always alone, having nothing to do with persons not in Krishna consciousness. Therefore, a person in Krishna consciousness is the perfect yogi. Okay, so that's a little fine point, but uh, later on Sri Tan writes that uh, he's quoting from uh, 827, so let's see what he says. 8th chapter, 27th verse. It says that it's talking about the two ways of leaving the body at the moment of death. And Prabhupada says the devotee should be firmly established in Krishna consciousness and chant Hare Krishna. He should know that concern over either of these two paths is troublesome. The best way to be absorbed in Krishna consciousness and to be always dovetailed in his service. And this will make one's path to the spiritual kingdom safe, certain, and direct. The word yukta, yoga yukta, is especially significant in this verse. One who is firm in yoga is constantly engaged in Krishna consciousness and all his activities. Sri Rupa Goswami advises, Anasakta Shavishayan Yatarham Upayonjitaha. One should be unattached to material affairs and do everything in Krishna consciousness. By this system, which is called yukta vairagya, one attains perfection. Therefore, the devotee is not disturbed by these descriptions because he knows that his passage to the supreme abode is guaranteed by devotional service. Okay, so the, 
The key statement here is the understanding of what Rupa Goswami says by the Sanskrit uh, phrase, anasaktasya vishayan yataraham upayun jitaha. And the saying, and the, and the meaning is that one should be unattached in material affairs and do everything in Krishna consciousness. Now, that does not mean that one is uh, unattached from matter. It says, unattached in material affairs. So, that means that one is different than a materialist. The materialist is attached to using material things for one's own selfish purpose. Whereas a devotee will use material things in the service of Krishna. That's what it means by do everything in Krishna consciousness. That is what yukta vairagya is. And one attains perfection in, in spiritual life that way. So there's a difference between using material things for sense gratification and using the same material things in the service of Krishna. Therefore it says, one who is firm in yoga is constantly engaged in Krishna consciousness in all his activities. Srila Rupa Goswami should, uh, 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 Srila Rupa Goswami advises, Anasakta Shavishan, one should be unattached to material affairs and do everything in Krishna consciousness. So that's unattached to using material things for sense gratification, but yet attached to using the same things in the service of Krishna. That's the correct understanding. Okay. So then Shritan quotes the verse, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away, and whatever austerities you perform, do that, O son of Kunti, as an offering to me. And in the following verse, Krishna s continues by saying, in this way you will be freed from bondage to work and, an auspici and its auspicious and inauspicious results. With your mind fixed on me and this principle of renunciation, you'll be liberated and come to me. So that's the whole point. Whatever you do, whether you, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away, and whatever austerities you perform, we should do that as an offering to Krishna rather than an offering to ourselves. So that's the meaning of anasakta shivishayan. Okay, so anyway, thank you, Shritan. Oh, and then in the end you say, the same point is stated in verse 1155. So from this we conclude that yukta vairagya is the path to reach Krishna. That is true, correct. The only difference is we're making we're showing the fine difference between using something material for sense gratification as opposed to using the same thing in the service of Krishna. We don't reject the thing, the material thing. We reject the incorrect use of it, but we accept the correct use of it. And again, in 11.55, Prabhupada says, he quotes the same verse, Anasakta Sevishayan by Rupa Goswami, but, he's, and, but he, then he explains. As far as work is concerned, one should transfer the energy entirely to Krishna conscious activities. So matter is a type of energy, right? There's spiritual energy and material energy. So then he says, no work should be done by any man except in relationship to Krishna. This is called Krishna karma. Karma means action. So if the action is to please Krishna, that's Krishna karma. One may be engaged in various activities, but one should not be attached to the result of his work. The result should be done only for him. For example, one may be engaged in business, but to transform that activity into Krishna consciousness, one has to do business for Krishna. If business is the proprietor, if, if Krishna is the proprietor of the business, then Krishna should enjoy the profit of the business. 
if a businessman is in possession of thousands and thousands of dollars, and if he has to offer all of this to Krishna, he can do it. This is work for Krishna. Instead of constructing a big building for his sense gratification, he can construct a nice building for Krishna, and he can install the deity of Krishna and arrange for the deity's service as is outlined in the authorized books of devotional service. This is all Krishna karma. One should not be attracted, attached to the result of his work, but the result should be offered to Krishna, and one should accept as prasadam the remnants of offerings to Krishna. If one constructs a very big building for Krishna and installs the deity of Krishna, one is not prohibited from living there, but it is understood that the proprietor of the building is Krishna, and that is called Krishna consciousness. If, however, one is not able to construct a temple for Krishna, one can engage himself in cleansing the temple of Krishna, and that is also Krishna karma. So you, you see, Sri Tan, it's not that all business is bad for being Krishna conscious. It's that when you use business and the energy of, you know, uh, in order to buy something and then sell it for a profit or make something and sell it for a profit and then use the profit for sense gratification, that's using the energy for the wrong purpose. But when you use that energy of transforming things or buying something and then selling it to make a profit, if you use that profit in Krishna consciousness, you, you get the profit by doing business, you're doing business, but the profit that you get from doing business, you use it in the service of Krishna, that's Krishna consciousness. So we don't reject matter, we, we reject using matter for sense gratification and the energy that's required to transform it or to, in some way or other, make a profit from that activity. We use that profit in Krishna consciousness rather than for sense gratification. So, so let's say you have a lemonade stand and you're selling lemonade and it costs you one dollar to make a glass of lemonade and you're selling the lemonade for two dollars so you end up with one dollar profit if you use that one dollar profit to buy a video game that you're going to play for your sense gratification that would not be krishna conscious that would not be uh, yukta vairagya but if you use that one dollar profit to buy uh, flowers that you offer to your deity of Krishna. That is yukta vairagya. You use the energy that you expend to make that profit and the profit itself in the service of Krishna. That's yukta vairagya. And falga vairagya, you buy, you, you make that effort, you make that dollar, but uh, well, no, no, you have the opportunity to, to uh, make the lemonade and then sell it for a profit, but you say, I'm not going to do this because the whole thing is maya. So that is falgu vairagya. It could have been used in Krishna's service, but you didn't do it. So that renunciation is incomplete. Okay. Srila Prabhupada Kijay. So now we're going to go to Shrestha's homework. So anyway, thank you, Shritan. You know, most of what you wrote is correct. It's just that one fine point that I wanted to uh, talk about. Okay. I just forgot. I got homework just now from Sanmuk and... Rhea, so, but we're going to read Shrestha's next. So, Shrestha says, What is the difference between Yukta Vairagya and Falgur Vairagya? Explain how you become free from the laws of karma through Yukta Vairagya. Explain the difference between Mayavadi philosophy and Krishna consciousness. Good, very good. One, what is the difference between yukta vairagya and falgu vairagya? Explain how you become free from the laws of karma 
through Yukta Vairagya explain the difference between Mayavadi philosophy and Krishna consciousness. Okay. And Shrestha writes, the difference between Yukta Vairagya and Falga Vairagya can be compared to the difference between real gold and fool's gold. Hmm. Although fool's gold appears to be very opulent and rich, its actual value is close to nothing. Real gold, on the other hand, has immense value. Similarly, the path of Yukta Vairagya and Falga Vairagya are both paths of renunciation. Correct. But Yukta Vairagya is real renunciation, whereas Falga Vairagya is false renunciation. Okay, that is true, but let's see if you find the difference, uh, the uh, defined difference, because Falga Vairagya is incomplete renunciation, not necessarily false renunciation. So you have to be able to make that difference. Uh, there, in, in both cases, in, in, Fagaraya, uh, in, in Yukta Vairagya and Fagaraya Vairagya, there is renunciation in both cases. But one is complete renunciation and the other is partial renunciation, or in, no, not partial, incomplete renunciation. So now we have to be careful with the word complete renunciation. Let's not use that word. There's the difference between selective renunciation and uh, incomplete renunciation. What does that mean? Okay, let's 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 see if if later on Shasta makes that point. She continues in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu one two one point two point two fifty five dash two fifty six. Sri Swami explains the definition of Yukta Vairagya and Falga Vairagya. Very good. Yukta Vairagya. Uh, is when one is not attached to anything, but at the same time accepts everything in relation to Krishna. That's complete renunciation. Okay. And Falga Vairagya, one who rejects everything without knowledge of its relation to Krishna. This is incomplete or false renunciation. Okay, good. She did explain the difference there. Okay, so uh, I, I first said complete renunciation, as Shrestha did, and then I sort of changed it to selective renunciation. And maybe that's not the right word, selective. But anyway, she explained what complete renunciation is. That is, when one is not attached to anything, but at the same time accepts everything in relation to Krishna. The Mayavadis are an example of those who follow the path of Falgu Vairagya. The reason why Falgu Vairagya is not complete renunciation is because as long as we are in the material world, action is necessary. These actions can only be purified by offering the results to Krishna. Very good point. As explained by Srila Prabhupada in the purport of Bhagavad Gita 9.28, Rupa Goswami says that as long as we are in this material world, we have to act. We cannot cease acting. Therefore, if actions are performed and the fruits are given to Krishna, then that is called yukta vairagya. Very good. And that's a quote. Otherwise, it is not possible to be renounced. Mayavadis or materialistic yogis might accept renunciation through the path of Falgu Vairagya, but that is incomplete. Very good point. My bodies and meditators might understand Brahman and Paramatma, but they do not understand Bhagavan, the highest form of realization. Therefore, they have not understood the absolute truth in, in the absolute truth in I N and a separate word complete. Okay, that's a little bit of a play on words. Uh, 
because if you read it quickly, it says, they have not understood the absolute truth incomplete. I said, they have not completely understood the absolute truth, is what you mean. As explained by Srila Prabhupada in the purport of Bhagavad Gita 6.10, a directly Krishna conscious person is the topmost transcendentalist because such a devotee knows what is meant by Brahman and Paramatma. His knowledge of the absolute truth is perfect. Whereas the impersonalist and the meditative yogi are imperfectly Krishna conscious. Realization of absolute truth requires realization of Brahman and Paramatma in relation to Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Correct. However, um, okay, so what you're saying is basically the Mayavadis, they sort of avoid the relationship of Brahman and Paramatma to Bhagavan or Krishna. So their understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth is incomplete, and therefore their actions are also incomplete. However, the Mayavadis do not understand and even deny the supreme position of the Lord and try to become one with God by merging into the Brahma Jyoti. They believe that real renunciation is to completely reject everything in the material world. However, if one does not understand that everything belongs to the Lord, then they can fall down from false renunciation and again fall victim to the desires of the senses. One such example is Vishramrita Muni. Srila Prabhupada talks about him through his lecture on Bhagavad Gita 426 on April 15, 1974. Very good. Big, big yogis, they failed, just like Vishramrita Muni. He was practicing yoga. That Indriya Samyamya, he, he was especially. So Indriya Samyamya means controlling the senses. Because he was king, so especially he was very sexually inclined in the yoga process. He was trying to control the sex. But what was the result? The result was that Menaka, a society girl of the heaven, she appeared and she was traveling there. There have been many instances like that. And tinkling of bangles, oh, immediately his yoga practice was broken and he became you write become, but it should be became attached by Menaka, and there was both, and there was birth of Sakuntala. There is a drama written by Kalidas Kavi Sakuntala. This is the subject matter how a yogi failed to control his senses and he was attached by a beautiful woman girl, and how Sakuntala, the beautiful girl, was born. That is the subject matter. So, this is sometimes impossible. There are many, many instances. So this is artificial way of yoga system, but when actually, as it is recommended, sabdadim indriyan yanya indriyagyesu juvati. That indriyagyesu means the indriya of Krishna. In, in other words, we use our senses to please the senses of Krishna. So. And, and then she, I, I just said that, but then Shrestha writes, when we satisfy the Indriya, the senses of Krishna, then automatically our senses become satisfied or engaged. So in the case of Vishramrita Muni, he was trying to control his senses, but he did not completely control his senses by engaging his senses to please the senses of Krishna. He was simply trying to control his senses. And that is incomplete renunciation. It's not complete renunciation. Therefore, he fell down. Therefore, we can see that even many big yogis have failed to control their senses by rejecting everything. 
This is because although they have renounced everything on the, s on the outside, they are not able to renounce the desires within. Very good point. As explained by Srila Prabhupada in a lecture on the Nectar Devotion on January 29th, 1973. One second. So uh, we'll stop right there for a second and then I'll continue again. But see, what, what Sh uh, Shrestha is saying is they renounced every. These yogis have renounced everything on the outside, but they are not able to renounce the desires within. So the proof that the desires within are also renounced is that one does not only renounce things. But if those things are capable of being served, used in the service of Krishna, they proactively use the same thing that they renounce for their own sense gratification, the same thing in the service of Krishna for his pleasure or for his sense gratification. So that would be yukta vairagya, complete renunciation. And falgo rairakya would be you would renounce something f for your own sense gratification, but you also but you ignore the fact that it could be used in Krishna's pleasure, uh, hap, uh, sense gratification. So your renunciation is incomplete. Like for example, uh, let's say. Someone says to a Mayavadi, I want to give you a donation. He says, oh, no, no, no. He says, I don't take donations. Uh, uh, because how did you earn that money? And they say, well, I, I uh, was selling marijuana. Says, oh, then I cannot accept that money because it's, it has been gained sinfully. Okay. However, what would a devotee say? Well, a devotee would also reject that money if it was gained sinfully. However, if the person who, give, who, who, who earned the money in an illegal way did not tell the devotee how they gained it, and they anonymously put the money in the hundi box. Now, the money that was gained illegally is in the hundi box. No one knows no, no, the devotee who opens the Hindu box and counts the money does not know how it was made. So, therefore, the devotee who opens the Hundi box and counts the money and puts the money in the bank and spends the money only for Krishna's pleasure is not affected by the sinful activity by which that money was gained. But if they know that the money was gained illegally and they still accept the money and use it in Krishna's service, then it, it, there could be an influence on the devotee because he would be encouraging the person to continue their sinful activity to gain money. And that would, that, that would mean that the devotee would be affected by the activity that gained the money, partially. So there's an example of this. Uh, now, we see, we made a difference between the devotee who opens the hundi box, the donation box, and there is money in there that was given by a person who was selling drugs. But the devotee doesn't know it. And, but the devotee uses the money in Krishna consciousness. So that way, uh, the devotee is not affected by the way the money was gained. But if the devotee knows, he accepts a donation from someone who tells him, I gained this money by selling drugs, and he accepts the money and uses it in Krishna's service, then he is going, he, it's possible that he will be affected by the sinful reaction. Why? Because he knowingly accepted the money 
and even though he used it in Krishna's service, by knowingly accepting the money from a drug dealer, he's encouraging the drug dealer to continue doing that activity. You see. So that then he would be affected. Now, there is an example. There was one devotee was a sincere person, but he engaged he engaged in illegal activity to gain a lot of money, which he gave to Prabhupada. Now, at one point, Prabhupada asked him, said, how are you making so much money? And at first, the devotee did not tell Prabhupada the truth. But later on, Prabhupada found out. When he found out, he told that devotee to stop immediately doing what he was doing. And that devotee promised that he would, but he continued doing it. And Prabhupada, at, at, from that point on, he, would, he did not accept, at least to my understanding, he did not accept uh, any money from him because he told him to stop earning it in that way immediately. But the devotee continued doing that, and therefore he ended up in jail. Prabhupada was not affected by it because once he knew for sure how that money was being made, he stopped accepting it. Okay. And he told the devotee to stop. But the devotee did promise that he would stop, but he didn't stop. So he got affected by it, meaning the devotee, but not Prabhupada. Okay, so that's a fine point, but it's, we should understand, if you knowingly accept money from someone who's gaining it illegally, even though you use it in Krishna's service, Krishna's, uh, well, you're going to get affected by it. But if you unknowingly use money that has been gained illegally, genuinely unknowing, because y the person put the money anonymously in the hundi box and then in the donation box, and then you count the money and you put it in the bank and you use it only for Krishna's service, you're not going to be affected. So you can't say, uh, how did you earn this money? And someone says, I earned it. So, Wait a minute, don't say how you did it, just give me the money. <laughs> or... If, you, if the person says, I earned it by selling marijuana, and you say, okay, I didn't hear that, give me the money. So, so you're going to be affected because you do know. Uh, or you stop them from saying how they earned it but you, you, because you know how they earned it. So you're going to be affected. But if you genuinely don't know because the person never told you and no one else ever told you and you use the money in Krishna's service, you won't be affected by it. But the person that gives the money, although what they did was good, they're going to be punished for the illegal activity. Okay. So, therefore, it says that one has to do business for Krishna. But to transform that activity into Krishna consciousness, one has to do business for Krishna. If Krishna is the proprietor of the business, then Krishna should enjoy the profit of the business. If a businessman is in possession of thousands and thousands of dollars, and if he has to offer all this to Krishna, he can do it. This is work for Krishna. Instead of constructing a big building for his sense gratification, he, construct a, he can construct a nice temple for Krishna, and he can install the deity of Krishna and arrange for the deity's service as is outlined in the authorized books of, the devo of devotional service. This is all Krishna kar karma. One should not be attached to the result of his work, but, at the, but the results should be offered to Krishna, and one should accept as prasadam the remnants of offerings to Krishna. So that's the meaning of anasakta Vishayan. So now Shrestha continues. I'm sorry I, I deviated for so long, but it's an important point. Therefore, we can see that even many big yogis have failed to control their senses by rejecting everything 
This is because although they have renounced everything on the outside, they are not able to renounce the desires within. As explained by Srila Prabhupada in a lecture on Nectar of Devotion on January 29, 1973, the Gaya city, the Gaya is, is, is the town where people go to perform pindudan, or it's the uh, offering of oblations. Or, uh, they offer prasadam to their deceased or dead relatives right, for the benefit of the relative. Okay. So, the Gaia city is situated on the river Falgu. This river is got, is got Falgu because on the bed you'll find only sand. In, in other words, this river got the name Falgu. That's what he means. Because on the bed, you'll find only sand. In other words, you don't see water. You only see sand. But if you push your hand within the sand, you'll find water. Similarly, because I mentioned this last week. Similarly, Falgu Vairagya means the so-called sannyasis, they have taken the dress of renounced order, but within the heart. They have got all the desires to fulfill within the heart. If you push your hand within his heart, you'll find he has got all desires for material enjoyment. That is called falgu vairagya. On the surface, there is no water, only sand. But within, oh, there is flow of water going on. Factually, a yukta, or one who follows yukta vairagya, does not reject everything. They actually accept and reject things based on their relation to the Supreme Lord. If something is favorable to the service of the Lord, then a pure devotee will accept that item and use it in the service of Krishna. If it is not something favorable to the service of the Lord or service of Krishna, then the devotee will be sure to avoid it. They also accept the prasadam or the remnants of offerings to the Lord in this way, they become purified and cannot be pulled down by material desires. The impersonalist might reject good prasadam, but the devotee will happily accept it, understanding that it is the cause, that it is the causeless mercy of the Lord as explained by Srila Prabhupada in the purport of Bhagavad Gita 263, the Gaya city is situated on the river Falgu. The, this river has, has got Falgu because it has received the name Falgu because on the bed of the river you'll find only sand. But if you push your hand within the sand, you'll find water. Similarly, Falgu Vairagya means the so called sannyasis, they have taken the dress of renounced order, but within the heart they have got all desires to fulfill, to fulfill. Within the heart, if you push your hand within his heart, you will find he has got all desires for material enjoyment. This is called Falgu Vairagya. On the surface, there is no water, only sand, but within, oh, there is flow of water going on. The key difference between Falgu Vairagya and Yukta Vairagya, if explained in two sentences, the yuktas understand the Lord is the proprietor of everything and they offer everything in the service of the Lord. Their only desire is to satisfy the senses of the Lord. The Falgus, on the other hand, do not accept the Supreme Person of Godhead and try to artificially renounce everything to achieve their desire of liberation or merging into Brahman. Here is a list I have created which explains the real qualities of a true yogi, one who follows the path of Yukta Vairagya. These points are extracted from the purports of Bhagavad Gita 6.10, 8.27, Bhagavad Gita 9.28, and Bhagavad Gita 11.55. And the, f the points follow. This is the expl explanation of a yukta vairagya. Always engages body, mind, and self in the service of the Lord. Knows that everything belongs to Krishna. Understands his own constitutional position. Well, she just writes, understands the, the constitutional position. That means his, should mean his own constitutional position as the eternal servant of the Lord. Free from feelings of renunciation. Uh, 
free from feelings of resonance, material possession. That's a wrong word, resonance, R-E-S-O-N-A-N-C-E. Free from feelings of renunciation. No, no, free from feelings of, I'm not sure what you want to say there. Free from feelings of resonance, material possession, no. Free from feelings of Mm. Oh, well, free from feelings of material possession. Next, no hankering for personal satisfaction, self-abnegation. Yes. Knows how to accept and reject things according to their favorability to Krishna consciousness. Always transcendental, above material attachment. Only associate with devotees. Not worried about liberation or performing the fruitive, and that's misspelled, actions prescribed in the Vedas. Okay, that could be a little misleading. Anyway, okay. Here is a chart explaining how the path of Yuktavayarga helps a devotee become free from the laws of karma. These points are extracted from Bhagavad Gita 928. Practice dovetailing activities to Krishna consciousness, transforming asat to sat. Mind becomes cleared from material desires, lust, anger, and other effects of the three modes of material nature. One becomes surrendered to the Supreme Personality Godhead one becomes liberated. This liberation is not impersonal liberation, it is beyond. One enters the planet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, thank you very much, Trista. There's a few little uh, corrections to be made, but otherwise it's very good. Okay, so then, we also received homework from um, Sanmuk and Rhea. Okay, let's look at Rhea. Let's see what she says. Okay, so she says, what is the difference between Fagaraga again and Yuktavairaga? Explain how you become free from the laws of karma through Yuktavairaga as a part of your explanation. Explain the difference between Mayavadi philosophy and Krishna consciousness. Okay, good. And it says, Yukta Vairag is dovetailing all actions and activities to Krishna consciousness. It is acting in Krishna consciousness under superior direction. That's the main point. And giving the fruits of our actions to Krishna. This also helps you overcome material bondage. In the Bhagavad Gita 3.9, Krishna says, work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed, otherwise work causes bondage, in this material world. Very good quote, Rio. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction, meaning Krishna, and in that way, you will always remain free from bondage. Very good. He also says in Bhagavad Gita 928, in this way, you'll be freed from bondage to work and its auspicious and inauspicious results with your mind fixed on me in this principle of renunciation. You will be liberated and come to me. Lord Krishna clearly explains that if you do everything as a service to him, you'll be free from material bondage and be free from the laws of karma. Falguvairagya is renouncing something that could have been used for the service of Krishna. This is false renunciation. Devotees use everything in the service of Lord Krishna and renounce what cannot be used for the Lord, which is the process of yukta vairagya. But Mayavadis renounce everything, even though it could have been used for the Lord, which is Falgu Vairagya. But Yukta Vairagya is the highest way of devotional service, and it will be free, and it will free you from the bondage of work, and it will help you reach Lord Krishna's eternal abode. Very good, Rhea. Very good. Okay. And then there's Sanmuk. Let's see quickly what he wrote. Okay, well, Sanmuk 
it's written on, okay, it says yukta vairagya. One type of vairagya is yukta vairagya. Bhagavad Gita 928 explains that yukta vairagya is acting in Krishna consciousness under superior direction. The technical term for this is yukta vairagya. Yukta vairagya is also defined by Srila Rupa Goswami and Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Anasakta Shavishayan. When one is not attached to anything, but at the same time accepts everything in relation to Krishna, one is rightly situated above possessiveness. Nice. So then he says, Srila Rupa Goswami mentions here that as long as in the material world we have to act and should not cease acting, correct? Yukta Vairagya is performing the actions and offering the fruits to Krishna, correct? When one is situated in such situation, his mind becomes cleared and gradually progresses in spiritual realization and completely surrenders himself to Krishna. By the system of Yukta Vairagya, one attains perfection. By doing so, one gets liberated and enters into the planet of the Supreme Lord. Characteristics of a person in Yukta Vairagya are he has complete and perfect knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the Absolute Truth, and so is directly in Krishna consciousness, Bhagavad Gita 6.10. He is always engaged in the loving service of the Lord, Bhagavad Gita 6.10. He is always situated in samadhi, which means concentration of mind on the Supreme, Bhagavad Gita 6.10. Cannot be understood by mundane materialistic people, as mentioned in C.C. Madhya 23.39, Bhagavad Gita 9.28. He's always thinking and planning on how to serve the Lord and therefore is considered completely liberated at present and in the future his going back to Godhead, back, back home, back to Godhead is guaranteed. Bhagavad Gita 9.28. Above all, materialistic criticism, just as Krishna is above all criticism. Bhagavad Gita 9.28. That's what, it, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that they're never criticized. Envious people will criticize un, un, uh, without validity some, someone out of jealousy or, or envy. But on, on careful examination of that person's act, activities, you can, you will, an honest person will see that there's no cause for uh, criticism. He is not bothered about the different paths the soul can take when leaving the material world as he knows that his passage to the supreme abode is guaranteed by devotional service, Bhagavad Gita 8.27. He is matpura, always considers the association of Krishna in his supreme abode to be the highest perfection of life, Bhagavad Gita 11.55. He is mad bhakta, always fully engaged in devotional service, specifically in the nine processes, either partly or all, of devotional engagement, hearing, chanting, remembering, worshiping, serving the lotus feet of the Lord, offering prayers and carrying out the orders of the Lord, making friends with him, and surrendering everything to him, Bhagavad Gita 11.55. He is Sangavarjita, that is, disassociates himself from persons who are against Krishna, Bhagavad Gita 11.55. He neither wants salvation nor wants to be transferred even to the highest planet, Goloka Vrindavana. His only objective is to serve Krishna wherever he may be, Bhagavad Gita 11.55. He is Nirvaira, that is, he has no enemies and is friendly to everyone. So he might have an enemy, but he doesn't consider his enemy an enemy. It's not that he has no enemies. He doesn't accept anyone as an enemy, even though someone may accept him as an enemy. Say. So he doesn't become his enemy's enemy. He neither wants... Um, let's see. He knows that only devotional service to Krishna can relieve a person from all the problems of life. Very good point. He risks his life for spreading Krishna consciousness. Examples are Thakur Haridas, Prahlad Maharaj, Jesus Christ. He knows that if a man is suffering, it is due to his forgetfulness of his eternal relationship with Krishna. Therefore, the highest benefit one can render to human society is relieving one's neighbor from all material problems. Very good. How this can be achieved, always remaining in seclusion and avoid disturbance by external objects, 
probably do the 610, by being careful and accepting favorable and unfavorable conditions that affect his realization, Bhagavad Gita 610, by not hankering after the unnecessary material things that entangles the feelings, that entangles one by feelings of possessiveness, so that you didn't write that co correctly, but anyway, Bhagavad Gita 610, by transferring energy completely to Krishna conscious activities, this is known as Krishna karma, Bhagavad Gita 1155, by not getting attached to the result of his work, but the results should be offered to Krishna, and one should accept as prasadam the remnants of offerings to Krishna, Bhagavad Gita 1155. So then he continues, and then he explains what Falgu Vairagya means by quoting the verse, Prapan Shikutaya Buddhya Hari Sambandhu Vasanayama Mukshubi Paritya Vairagyam Falgu Katyate. On the other hand, one who rejects everything without knowledge of its relationship to Krishna is not as complete in his renunciation. Very good. So Falgu Vairagya means false renunciation. Well, yes, but Actually, you have to use the correct words, though. Uh, it is false renunciation, but it's incomplete renunciation. So, and he quotes Prabhupada in a lecture that says, Sofago Varaga means that I am giving up, renouncing everything superficially, but within me there is a desire how to become God. He hasn't given that up. The perfect example for those who follow Falgo Varga, you are the Mayavadi philosophers. No, well, <laughs> he wouldn't say, okay, he'd say perfect example, but I would say rather the example for those who follow Falgo Varga, because they're, they're not perfect <laughs> in, in the sense of it's the right thing. They're perfect in the sense of it's the wrong thing, so you wouldn't use the word perfect, you'd say, an example for those who follow Falgu Vairagya are the Mayavadi philosophers. Mayavadis renounce everything and live in a secluded place meditating on the impersonal Brahman. They believe that everything and everyone is God, but somehow one forgets that they were God and therefore they are suffering. When one renounces everything, not knowing that it can be used in the service of the Lord, then they are considered to have no knowledge. Well, again, incomplete knowledge instead of no knowledge. It is further explained in Bhagavad Gita 610 that those who are too attached to the impersonal Brahman or the localized super soul are also partially Krishna conscious because the impersonal Brahman is the spiritual ray of Krishna and the super soul is the all-pervading partial expansion of Krishna therefore they are indirectly in Krishna consciousness. Well, yes, okay. Good, so the homework for tomorrow is to uh, focus on the word Krishna karma as opposed to karma. Explain the difference between karma and Krishna karma. And Uh, so, uh, and, and, and you, you're going to do this by reading 1155 carefully, the whole purport. And in the purport, Prabhupada talks about, in this verse, Srila Rupa Goswami clearly states that if anyone wants to execute unalloyed devotional service, he must be freed from all kinds of material contamination. He must be freed from the association of persons who are addicted to fruitive activities, and mental speculation. When freed from such unwanted association and from the contamination of material desires, one favorably cultivates knowledge of Krishna. That is called pure devotional service. So, see if you can find examples of people who may be freed from the association of persons who are addicted to fruitive activities, but not necessarily freed from mental speculation or the opposite. They're free from mental speculation, but they're not 
freed from association of persons who are addicted to fruit of activities. So then, in either way, they would not be uh, in pure devotional service. And then Prabhupada quotes the verse, Anakulyasya Sankalpa Pratikulyasya Varjanam. Explain what that means. This is in the purport of 1155, where it says, one should think of Krishna and act for Krishna favorably, not unfavorably. And then it talks about kamsa and so forth. So you're going to explain the difference between favorable and unfavorable uh, cultivation, uh, unfavorable uh, focus on Krishna and explain the difference and give examples of someone who may be freed from the association of persons who are addicted to fruit of activities but has not stopped mental speculation or opposite to that they have they're freed from mental speculation but does not have not given up the association of persons who are addicted to fruit of activities Okay, that's your homework for tomorrow. You're going to have to do some research, but it's all in Bhagavad Gita 11.55. 11.55. Are there any questions? Got anything, Daniel? Okay, so we'll stop right there, unless there's a last minute submission. Haribo, all glories to Prabhupada.